So we read in the scriptures at the concluding at the conclusion of the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood up with a loud voice and said, If any man is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. And so the invitation was to come to him to drink. And when he gathered the apostles, he gathered them so that they might be with him. And that was the master plan of evangelism, that they would learn of him and see how he ministered and how he did life and how he was with children and, we, and we, how he was with women and how he ministered and how he prayed and how he lived. And so when he gathered his apostles, it was to himself for emotional connection. For them to be part of his life, to see how he did what he did. And on one occasion he said to his the disciples, said to him, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to live, teach us how to be. Teach us how to prioritize, teach us how to order our steps, how to order our lives in ways that are honoring in ways that are the most effective. And so he drew them to himself and they learned of him. And as God has, the Father has drawn us to himself and, and to one another this morning and this afternoon is that we might learn of him how to. And Paul, you've been very instrumental in demystifying and simplifying and clearing the clutter from our minds about how we think it ought to be done. And just pre presenting the path to be so simple. For there is a simplicity in Christ that we confuse and we layer with all sorts of other things that don't matter that much, but we've made them so important. And so, Paul, you've been able to distill for us the essence, the simplicity of purity and passion and prayer, simplifying it in ways that we can understand, we can relate, and in ways that we can practically apply. And purpose is one of those things. It's become all so important, purpose and destiny, but what is it? Is there a grand master plan? And if there is, what's our place in that? What should we be doing, busy doing? How do we organize and prioritize our lives around what values, around whose purpose? What's it all about? And so I'm going to invite Paul again to demystify and simplify and to declutter from our thinking so that we may walk in a very practical simple but effective way. So for the last time for this occasion, we just put your hands together as Paul comes and... Amen. Thank you, brother. I don't know about demystify, I'm like... Um, but thank you for those words. You know, that's a big compliment for me because that's what I want to do. I want to... I want my life to be one, my ministry to be one that does make things simple for people so that we can actually go and be and do what God called us to be and do, right? And that's really our purpose. Our purpose is to be and do what he has called us to be and do, what Jesus lived and died for us to be able to be and do. And that really is what it is that we're meant to be. You know, we read it in Genesis from the, the first book in chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 through 28 on, and onwards. You start to see what our purpose is. And our purpose is to be images of God. To, to be images. What does that mean? That means that, you know, Christ said that he was the image of the invisible God, right? That Christ is the image. Going back to that two powers in heaven. Stuff that the, the ancient rabbis used to talk about. About that there was the invisible God. The God who is spirit. And then there was the God who manifests on the earth. That became Christ. And we see that Christ imaged his father. And he, he, he only did what he saw his father, was do, father doing. That means that our purpose is not always going to be comfortable to us. It's not always going to be something that is for our benefit. And when we understand that our purpose is bigger than just getting our own needs met, you know, getting our little 2.5 kids, 
right, 2.4 kids. One, I always thought, what's the point four kid called? Like Arthur, like Arthur kid. Um, you know, we, we've got to have a house, we've got to have a car, we've got to have a job, we've got to have a career, and all them things are good. They're all good, right? But really and truly, there's more to life than just having material stuff. There's not just matter, is it? It's the things that matter. And uh, life's more than just materialistic stuff. And we live in a materialistic environment. We live in a materialistic culture. Um, and we are really minions in the machine, aren't we? We, we are, you know, we're trained from, from, from children as we go to school. The education system is to create workers that are going to be worker bees and drones that, you know, fill up the honey pot for the, the queen and, the, you know, the ones that are above us. And it is true. It's not, it's not a conspiracy theory. It is true. It's just how the world works. There are people that, that want to do that stuff, and we fit in, don't we? And as long as we're kept mollified and, you know, uh, uh, as long as we're, we're kept in that soporific kind of state of, you know, just, just being happy watching the telly and watching a match and having our pint on a Friday or whatever it is if you drink or having a fish and chips or getting your car, a new car, nice holiday once a year, it's all good in the hood. But is that it? I mean, if you go back to how we started, and I was talking about how I had no meaning, no purpose, how I had darkness come upon me, you know, I still suffer every now and again from these depressive, depressive uh, uh, episodes. But now I can deal with it in a day where it used to take me a month or a week or a year, you know what I mean? Now it's like a day. It's just, you know, it's just getting back in the presence of God and just letting him do what he does and refocusing on what really matters. It's about what really matters. And sometimes we, we have so much drama in our lives because we're focusing on matter. We're focusing on material things, right? We're focusing on feeling that we're a failure because we ain't got a job or we ain't got this house or we ain't got that. And what we've got to understand is that the enemy of contentment is comparison. And you can be doing really well until you see someone who's doing better and then all of a sudden you're not doing so good. Or is that just me, right? And what God's saying is, don't focus on them. Don't focus on this or that. Focus on me. Because I'm the one you need to be focused on. And when you focus on me, you will really start to find what your meaning in life is. Why you were born. We all celebrate when we were born. How many of us celebrate why we were born? We have our birthdays, we have anniversaries, we have all of these things, Christmas and all the rest of it, right? But what about celebrating why we were born? When you find your purpose, when you come into that place of calling. And there's a thing about calling, the calling of God and the, the, the placement of God, really, really important. And I always look at it, I've looked at it many, for many years, and there's three elements to the calling of God, right? Which and places us in our purpose. And we see in Isaiah, don't we? We read in Isaiah chapter 5 when he's before the throne of God, he's in a vision, in prayer. And he sees the Lord high and lifted up, the train of his robe filling the temple. And, uh, you know, the Lord wants to know who's going who's gonna, to who's gonna go for him, who's going to work for him, who's going to do this. You know what I mean? And Isaiah's there, but he's like, you know, he's messed up. He, you know, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And then the Lord cleanses him. The Lord takes a coal from the altar and goes and cleanses his lips. He goes and cleanses him. God will, you know, we hear it, don't we? It's not just a mantra, it's true. God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. But what does it mean to be called? What does it mean to have the calling of God upon our lives? Is it just for a certain few? Well, you know, there are a certain few in um, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, with the, the, the gifts of the Son as differentiated from the gifts of the Father and the gifts of the Spirit. Gifts of the Father are your creational gifts. Someone's fit and good looking like me. Someone might be musical. No one caught that. He caught, Dave caught that. I try to slip that one in there. You know what I mean? It makes me feel better. But some people are musical, right? That's a gift of the Father. Some people are mathematical. That's a gift of the Father. They're creational gifts. And different people have different creational gifts. Some people are just athletic, can they? How many of you knew them kids at school that smoked and drank and can still run 1,500 metres cross country quicker than you? You know what I mean? And you was, you was living good. It just don't, ain't fair, is it? Some people are skinny with a six-pack and they don't work out. 
and you go to the gym and you're still fat. It's just un it's unnecessarily unkind. But they're gifts of the Father. Then you've got the gifts of the Spirit, and there's been all sorts of controversy over that in church circles, hasn't there, about, you know, you've got the chosen frozen on one side of the Christian extreme, you know, that, uh, you know, God, God, the Holy Spirit retired once, you know what I mean? When the Bible, was, that was it. You know, the Bible, the canon of Scripture was closed, and so the Holy Spirit retired. There's no more gifts. Then on the other hand, you've got the charismaniacs, where everything is, you know, you know, is, everything's mental, isn't it? It's just mad. And, 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 and then you've got the middle ground. You've got people that just believe that the, 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 the Spirit still operates in, you know, in ways that are supernatural. I tell my people in church, I say, we're a full gospel church. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit. But if you start barking like a dog, one of my security will take you out for a walk. So let's get it right. But the Spirit still comes and drops gifts as and when. We don't own those gifts, right? We just become available for those gifts. We might be more accessible to certain gifts than others. You know, you might be more susceptible to the word gifts or might be a discernment thing you have or a faith gift, gift or whatever. But the Holy Spirit comes and he drops gifts as and when necessary, right? And then you've got the gifts of the Son. The gifts of the Son are the Ephesians gifts, the five-fold ministry gifts. And it says, to some he, Jesus, gave to be apostles, pastors, prophets, teachers, evangelists, whatever, right? So not everyone has those gifts. So not everyone's called to operate in certain areas. It's not for everyone. But what is the calling of God? What is the calling of God? I have the title pastor, but that's not really my gifting. Are you with me? Uh, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an introvert. You know, if you do the male hierarchy characteristics, you know what I mean? I'm a sigma, not, not an alpha. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm one of those, you know, I'm, I, I, can, I can do it, but I just can't be bothered to get involved in all the drama. Um, so there's all the, them types of things. Uh, but what is the calling of God? What, what, what is it? Where, where, where does God want us to fit? What is our purpose? I, I, I was doing this once with an Irish guy, and I, I spent half hour thinking that he was talking about some type of dolphin. He was talking about porpoise. 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 Yeah, porpoise. I'm like, what's he talking about dolphins for? But, um, because there's a misconception. We can easily get it wrong. But there's different levels of leadership stuff. I did my master's degree in biblical theology and transforming leadership. And so I've studied all the different types of leadership stuff. You know, there's, there's all different types of trait theory, this theory, that theory, transactional, transformational, blah, 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 right? Definitions of leadership. But in practicality, I try to work it out in planting churches, raising people, discipling people. You know, what really are people's natural bents? And I came down to three, three categories. You're either going to be goal orientated Right? You're going to be a prophetic, visionary type of leader, goal-orientated. Or you're going to be task-orientated. So you're going to be a, a managerial, administrative type. Or you're going to be people-orientated. So you're going to be a pastoral, caregiving type. That's going to be your natural bent. That's going to be your main emphasis, your main thing. Once you identify what you are, in your natural ability, you're going to not make as many mistakes. You're not going to, you know, suffer so much. Other people ain't going to suffer so much because you're going to be able to flow in your gifting and then you're going to be able to team up with other people that can fill in the gaps. So, for example, I'm a visionary, so I have to have around me administrators and people, people, people. I have to have pastors. I have an eldership um, team where there's, there's seven pastors on our eldership team. I think it's seven, and uh, there was nine. I think there, there's still seven left. Um, anyway, they're pastors. They help me pastor the church, right? I'm a visionary. I need people to pastor. Then we have an administrational team. We have a business management team of administrators. They help me to administrate. Are you with me? And everyone's empowered to do their thing and fulfill their purpose. And once they're in their, in their proper place, everything works well. People are not trying to do what they're not meant to be doing because they think that everyone needs to be doing it. I need to be doing everything. You know, and some people think that, especially pastors, that we're like some one-man band, that you've got, a, you know, you've got a drum strapped to your back, you've got a cymbal on your head, you're playing a guitar, you're playing a mouth organ all at the same time, you know, you're painting, you're doing the admin, you're doing this, you're cutting the grass. You're... No, stop it. 
That's why churches are small. That's why pastors get burnt out. That's why most people stay in place for like five years and then they're done. It's because we don't know our purpose or our place. But once you understand and identify that, it makes things simple. It makes things easy. Not easy, but simple. And then you can start to work in a team because teamwork really does make the dream work. Right? So the calling of God then comes down to three things as well. We're called, first of all, to follow a person. You're called to follow a person, Jesus Christ. That goes across the board to every Christian. We're called to follow a person, right? You're also called to follow the person who's following that person sometimes. Because I mean, if you know, we're all meant to be followers before we're leaders. Just as Moses had uh, Joshua, Elijah had Elisha, you see it all the, all the way down. Paul had Timothy, etc., etc., right? So all of these people went on to become great in their own right. But first of all, they understood followership before they ever attempted leadership. And having that in our mentality is very, very crucial, very necessary. But we're called to follow the person of Jesus Christ. We're called to follow him with all of our lives. We're called to stay focused on him. We're called to follow him, you know, faithfully. We're called to follow him in humility. We're called to follow him. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he said, all the things that you've seen and heard of me amongst many witnesses, commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Right? So there's four generations of, of this following and this committing. Four steps. So you're called to follow a person. We're all meant to be under authority, in submission. I really get worried when people have no one that they're submitted to or accountable to. It worries me. I get uneasy. Do you know what I mean? Cause, cause, because then it's, it, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not biblical, it's not faith. Where was the one time that Jesus spoke about great faith in the Bible? It wasn't to a Jew, it was to a Gentile. It was to the centurion who had a sick servant. And the, 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 Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. He went, no, 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 Lord, don't come to me, ass. Don't worry about it. He said, I'm, he just said, just say the word. He said, I'm a man in submission. Therefore, I have authority. Because without submission, you have no authority. You can have power, but without authority. You just become dangerous. So this followership is part of our purpose. Being able to be a follower. Because that will keep you humble. It will keep you accountable. It will keep you on track. It will keep you faithful. It will keep you in a place of submission that releases then authority. Are you with me? Then then you are called for a purpose. Ephesians chapter uh, 2, right? Um, verses 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good things, do good works that he's prepared before and that you should walk, walk in them, right? There's a purpose. There's a plan. Specific, unique purpose for each individual there's a generic one our purpose is to go out take back reclaim territory geographical territory so the great commission is geographical go out to all the nations but also he says i'll be with you to the end of the age it's also generational we also have to make sure that this continues generationally down the line right so our purpose is to image god and to go and take back territory in the world that he has won back from under the authority of, 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 of uh, the fallen angels. And, and, and some people think that, you know, Satan's in charge and everyone else follows his lead. But it's more, of a, it's more chaotic than that in the kingdom of darkness. Um, there are different types of people that have, you know, different types of authority um, in the kingdom of darkness. You've got different rulers, different thrones, different powers, different this, different that, different principalities. It's chaotic. But we're to go and we're to reclaim the territory because now their authority has been taken away by Christ. But the reason why, you know, the world is not saved is because lots of people haven't gone. We want a lot of people to come, but we don't want to go. We want people to come to our church, but do we go into their neighborhood? Do we go into the, the places that they're at? Do we go to the places, you know, do we go with the gospel? Do we make disciples? We want to build our churches, right, as pastors. But that's not our job. 
Jesus said, I will build my church. He said, your job is to make disciples. And sometimes we, we, we spend a lot of time trying to build our church and we expect the Holy Spirit to make all the disciples. And then we wonder why the darkness still stays on the face of the earth and the light don't shine. It's because we're getting it backwards. That's not our purpose. Our purpose is not to build a structure. Our purpose, you, you, we in place structures, we need that in churches. Our purpose is to make disciples. To make disciples. God will then bring the increase. Amen? That's how it's meant to work. So, this, this, this purpose generically is to take ground. But personally, personally, our purpose is to fit in and slot into the place that God has said for us to fit in and slot into. And that takes humility. It takes honesty. You know, you, you might not be a preacher. You might be a teacher. That's cool. Teach. You might not be the leader. You might be the, the, the second man. Be the second man. Are you with me? You might be the up and coming man. You might not be the man yet. Wait until you're released to do what it is that God wants you to do. You might not be the one that's good looking. That's fine. When Paul spoke to the Corinthians about Timothy, he said, I'm sending Timothy to you. Take care of him. Don't treat him harshly. Watch out. He said, watch this. He said, I asked Apollos to come, but Apollos said that he, would, he, he wasn't willing to come. He'll come later. Check out the difference. Timothy was weak. He was, he was a, a half-breed, right? He was known for his sickness. He was known for his youth. He was known for this and that. He wasn't known for being strong, the man of power for the hour. Apollos, born in Alexandria, the seat of learning, right? He was a trained orator. He was named after the god of war. He probably had a six-pack, looked like Brad Pitt, had really white teeth, never been to Turkey to get them. They were natural. You know, he was, he was brilliant everything but Paul said he wasn't willing Timothy was willing Apollos had everything going for him but we don't see any letters in the New Testament written the letter of Apollos so it's not about appearance it's about purpose it's about being there doing the right thing at the right time being faithful you know when the parable of the talents right you know what, what are you going to hear well done pastor of a mega church well done teacher you know, of, of Bible college. Well done, author of many books. Well done, songwriter of all these anthems, Christian anthems. No. Nah. What are we going to hear? Well done, good and faithful servant. You fulfilled your purpose. You took what I gave you. You invested it. You got a return. You did something good with it. So that's the purpose. We're all called to that to image God, to become like him, to shine like him, to represent him. Someone said to me, how come people don't come to church a lot? You know, how come people don't become Christians a lot? I said, two reasons. Either they've never met a Christian or they have. What type of image? What type of image are you presenting? Are you with me? What type of image do we present of God? A harsh, cruel, cold God that people think that is the Old Testament God. When in turn, no, it's, it's not. You know, he's not different in the Old Testament than the New Testament. Or is he this loving, all-tolerant God that you can come and do anything you want and be however you want, live how you want, and it's all about love, isn't it? You know, it's all tolerant. Everything's about tolerance now, unless you're a white, straight, um, male Christian. You know what I mean? Then there's no tolerance. Or in some places, unless you're a black, straight Christian. Tolerance works as long as it's agreeing with your level of tolerance, right? So, you know, what is it? Where is it? So the purpose of our lives is to image God, to represent him, to reflect him, not just reflect ourselves, our opinions. Everyone's got opinions. Just like everyone's got armpits, you know, but some of them stink, right? We have to understand that. Not every opinion smells nice. So how do we work all that out? The third element of the calling of God is the process. There's no shortcut to the cutting edge. It takes time. It takes, and here's the thing. Some people, I was, I was a minister after five years of salvation. From five years from being a drug addict, to being ordained as a minister, five years. Within that five years, I'd graduated the Victory Home. 
I've gone back in, run the victory home. I've been a missionary in India, went out there, we helped start a church, come back, did another discipleship home for men coming out of the victory homes, out of the program, then went to Israel in 99, helped start a church, run the home over there in Jerusalem, come back in 2000, did me exams, and was ordained as a minister. And some people are like 20 years in, still not, you know, still not in their purpose. They're like, how did you do it so quick? How, did, da, 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 da. how comes it takes us so long? One thing I've come to understand is that, first of all, God doesn't measure time. God measures growth, right? God measures growth. And then you grow at the speed of obedience. You grow at the speed of obedience, right? There's a thing in my book, if you want to, re want to read it, you'd have to buy it. Hallelujah. Um, even if you don't want to read it, just buy it. Amen. There's a few left. Um, but there's a bit in there called the Satnav Principle, or for our American friends, GPS Principle. Actually, I was in Mexico. I met a guy called Mike Dwyer, who was a colonel in the U.S. Air Force, who actually, his claim to fame was that he piloted the first ever, um, ever flight, ever plane, ever, ever anything that used GPS for navigation. 1981 or something like that. From Andrews Air, Andrews Air Force Base out to Honolulu or something. They used GPS. Before that, it was, it was nav track and all the rest of it. It was all, G, it was all you know, trigonometry and uh, all that stuff. And GPS was used for missile guidance. So all of a sudden, they've released some stuff and now they're using GPS for navigation. So I started to look into this. Watch this. And I started to look into the GPS when we're talking, talking about process. What does, a, what does a sat nav do? It does three things. First of all, it locks in your location. Your location, when you're talking about process, is where you're at, where you're really at, right? And who you are. It's about identity, it's about placement. Are you where you say you are? Are you where you think you are? Are you who you think you are? All of these things. Once these things are locked in, it's very, very important. And there are a lot of people that have been 10, 15, 20 years in Christianity that have never ever locked in those basic fundamentals of identity in Christ and who they are, right? So if the, if the, if the satellite cannot lock in your location, forget it. You ain't going nowhere. But once it locks in your location, what's the next thing you do? You enter a destination, right? And some people then think of the process, they think of the calling, they think of purpose, they think of entering a destination. That is like their life destination. You know, I'm going to be a master chef. I'm going to be a pastor of a mega church. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But the last time I put, put you know, when I came here, I put this destination in my satnav, And it got me here. I didn't put the destination I was going to be when I'm 75. Do you know what I mean? So let's, let's make sure that we understand that when that you're part of your purpose, once your location is locked in, you enter the next destination. Not the, the ultimate destination. What do you want to do next? What's God calling you to do next? Where does he want you to go next? Right? Then once you've entered the destination, then what happens? Then it starts giving you instruction. But if, the key is this, going back to that obedience thing, you've got to do what it tells you to do. Otherwise, you're not going to receive another instruction or get where you want to go. So, for example, if it says, for 100 yards and turn right, and I did it like that because my satnav's got a woman's voice. Someone said to me, Pastor Paul, why has your satnav got a woman's voice? I said, because I'm married. I'm used to taking instructions from a woman. Right? Just second nature. You know what I mean? But if it tells you to go 100 yards and turn right and you go 50 yards and park up, you're going to be sitting there twiddling your thumbs. The problem is, for many Christians, is God tells them what to do and then they don't do it. And then they, I have people come to me. How many of you have this? Can you pray for me? Why? God hasn't spoke to me for ages. Well, no, I'm not going to pray for you. Why? Well, let me ask you a question. Okay. Have you done what he told you to do last time yet? Oh, no. Well, go back and do that, then come back to me and I'll pray for you. Because unless you do what he tells you to do, why is he going to speak to you again? The only time a satnav speaks to you again, if you, if you disobey it, is to tell you to repent. Do a U-turn. Do a U-turn. Right? 
That's the only time God speaks. When he gives you an instruction, or he tells you to get back and do what he told you to do. So in our process, we have to understand that there are things that you need to be doing in the process towards your purpose. It's not rocket science here. It is about obedience. It is about doing what he says. It is about reading his word and doing what he says. It is about application. It's not just about inspiration. It's not just about, you know, all of that. It's about application. Some of the simplest things we do not do, and then we wonder why we don't get where we want to get or get what we want to get. So there's a process. There's no shortcut to it. There has to be a sharpening. Ecclesiastes 10.10, 10, without, you know, an, uh, if the axe blade is dull, it will take more effort to cut down a tree. But wisdom brings success. What's wisdom? The right application of knowledge. How do you get wisdom? Either from your mistakes or someone else's mistakes. Right? Better to get wisdom from someone else's mistakes than your mistakes. But you have to apply it. And the thing about purpose, we can say what our purpose is. You know, your purpose, you can prophesy over people, you can talk, talk, talk to people, but unless they then take it and they apply it and they put it into practice, their purpose is just going to stay out of reach. They're never going to fulfill it. They're going to be frustrated. They're going to end up being frustrated, unfulfilled Christians because they did not just do the simple things that God wants them to do to get to the place that he wants them to get to. And the thing is, once you do what it says, that sat -nav, it then gives you another instruction. And that's how it works. That is how Christianity works. That's how purpose works. That's how it is. You're called to follow a person. You're called for a purpose. And you're called to go through a process. That process is that Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. You're in a perfect place because of the sacrifice of Christ. But now you're being sanctified. Now you're on a path towards holiness. Now you're shedding all of that old stuff, putting aside, laying it, laying it down, forgetting what lies behind, laying that weight aside, all the sin that so easily ensnares you, laying down all of the robes of, of unrighteousness and sin and shame and doubt and fear and all that, laying all that down and just starting to run like that athlete that God wants you to be starting to fight like the soldier that he wants you to be, starting to sow like the farmer that he wants you to be, starting to make a difference for good in the world that you live in. That's your purpose, to image God, to reflect his light, to see darkness go wherever it is that you go, to take back the land, to take back the ground, to take back people's souls from the enemy of, 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 of God. That's it. It ain't, it ain't hard. When we do what it is that we're meant to be doing. Because God makes it simple. God gives us the grace. There's no excuse. The thing is you can make an excuse. Or you can make it happen. And you make it happen by trusting God. And letting him do what it is he wants to do in you and through you. So that you can become everything he created you to be and do. And that's it. What I want to do right now, very quickly, because I know we've got a little bit of time, a couple of minutes. Just want a bit of feedback, guys. Anything you've learned, take away thing, something, a nugget. Question, maybe, something you've disagreed with. You know, I'm always open for that. You know what I mean? I might not listen to it, but I'm open for it. Praise the Lord. Does that make sense? Huh? Has it been helpful at all? Because I'm, I'm lazy, really. I don't want to go for all complicated stuff, you know what I mean? I want it to be simple. I want it to be simple. So I've, I've been on a mission to ruthlessly simplify the complicated things of theology. I call it rheology. Rheology. Taking theology, the knowledge of God, and making it so that it's applicable and real in our lives. If we can do that, then we can honour God, we can glorify him, we can serve him much better. Because we get away all the faff and all the nonsense and all the stuff and all of the stuff that twists us and mangles us and stops us from just doing what it is he wants us to do. Because I'm fed up with people that would cross a city to win a doctrinal argument but wouldn't cross the street to win a soul. I'm sick of all that. I'm done with it. Whatever. You know, you want to talk theology, I'll talk theology with you all day long. But let's talk about it looking at our commonalities, not just fighting over our differences. Because the world around us is going to hell, people are dying, 
and you want to argue with me about predestination, mate, people like that, I want to give them COVID symptoms and slap the taste out of their mouth. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Glory to God. I mean, it's just people have said to me, you know, they say that, well, you could always go back. We could always go back to something. But directional perspective. That's why I do this directional perspective. Focus on Jesus. We're following Jesus. And just keep putting one foot in front of the other. That's all it is. That's all it is. We walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith. We follow him every day. If you just do one step a day, in one year you've got 365 steps further than you would have been. And that's all it is. And the thing is this, I tell people in, in addiction, you know, God transforms us. You're not an addict anymore. I'm not an addict anymore. You know, physiologically, after nine months of staying drug-free, your synapses and neural bridges will remorph back into how they were or even be stronger than where they were. That's just a biological, physiological, scientific thing, right? So once a junkie, always a junkie is a lie from the pit of hell. It doesn't have to be. So that strength comes that you're not a junkie anymore, right? I even flip, freak people out by, you know, in the 12-step things by saying I'm recovered. You know what I mean? I'm not in recovery. I'm recovered because Jesus has set me free. I'm a new creation, right? And I, I you know, I respect them and what they do and it helps people out and it's all, it's all good. But I'm not, I'm not taking that I'm in recovery for 20 years. You know what I mean? I'm recovered. You know, God's, yeah, God's done it. And I tell people this, listen, even if, even if the addiction and the temptation is still there, because it's still going to be there sniffing around, right? It's still there. We live in a world of temptation and madness. As long as you keep walking in the same direction, it can't catch you back up. There's a gulf between you that is set. It's, only, it's, like, walking, it's like walking up a down elevator, like a, a down escalator. You ever done that? Right? Lunatics, rebellious lunatics. But you'll get to the top if you keep going. But what happens if you stop? Right? You go back. So don't stop. Just keep walking, man. Jesus said, follow me. He didn't give him any pit stops, did he? Follow me for a few years, and then after that, lads, you know what I mean? Have a breather. You know, the Romans sniff around a little bit. Don't worry. Have a breather. You know, send Brian instead. Just keep walking. And then whatever it was that was, was binding you, can't catch you back up, man. Can't catch you back up. Uh... But some of them have got saved. I've had uh, uh, several people from my past that have got saved. Um, some people are dead. You know, there's a lot of people that I know that are dead. Some people are banged up. You know, I just try to get one of my mates out. He's done 24 years. And um, we try to get him out. And uh, he came out for a little bit, went back in, because the system's not really set up for people like that. But he's out at the minute, I think. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a long time ago, man. It's 27 years. So that's why it's almost like I was that man, but I'm not that man now, you know. I have memories. I've lived that life. You know what I mean? It is seared into my memory, some of the things that we did. I know how to work, work that life. There's still some things that I do now. Some of the ways I come across and look, I don't even mean it. Um, I'll be in a, you know, in a restaurant. I'll, I'll you know, know where the entrance is, where the exit is. My wife, you know, she's like, nothing's going to happen. You're a pastor. I'm like, you've got to be prepared, love. You know what I mean? <laughs> You know, I, I must admit, I still have an axe um, indoors and, a, 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 you know, a retractable baton. And my, my son knows how to pick locks. And, you know, there's different stuff. He's 15. You know, he's, he knows how to pick locks and use a butterfly knife and um, etc. So there's, there's stuff that spills over, you know. Um, but I'm not that man anymore. But because I have been, it gives me an in into that environment. I've preached in prisons and different places on the streets and street gangs. And I, I talk, we had a, a young kid in our church last year, sadly got murdered in Salford, got, got run over and then stabbed to death just after his 17th birthday. And at his, best, his memorial service, his, his celebration of life. And this was a kid, he'd gone off the rails. You know, my wife had been at his birth. I dedicated him as a baby. I'd baptized him with my son as a teenager. And then I had to bury him as a teenager. He went off the rails a little bit got involved in gang violence, but his celebration of life, all the little gangs came, 
and I was able to minister to them. And I can talk to them from a, a, a perspective, do you know what I mean? Because I've been there, I've done what you've done, you know what I mean? I, I know what you're doing. Da, 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 da. I've done this, I've done that, I've been here, I've done this, I've done that. And it gives me a little in that some other people don't have necessarily. Um, because it doesn't matter how incredible you are, if you're not credible to the people you're trying to speak to sometimes. Um, so, you know, but it's a long time ago. And uh, people say, do you, you know, do you still know people? Are? The people, it's Albanians running our, the, the area that we used to run now. I ain't got no in with them. Time goes on, you know, time goes by. We, we, we leave our past behind, don't we? Hopefully, you know, start living, living the way God wants us to be now. But I still come up, you know, every now and again, someone will come up, someone will come in my home. I used to have it with out on the road. You know, someone will come in one of our programs that we used to rob. And one guy got up and testified in a meeting once. And he said, yeah, I want to thank God for my salvation. You know, I'm so grateful. I've done this, I've done that, I've been in jail for eight years, I've got this, I've done that, I did this, I did that, and now I'm in Victory Outreach and my pastor used to sell me drugs. <laughs> Which was a bit of a trip. And I was like, yeah, you owe me money as well, didn't you? <laughs> Anyone else before we... We wrap up? Yes. You know, I'm, I'm not a fatalist like that. I'm not one of these odd determinists like, you know, the, some of the Calvinists where God makes everything happen. But, you know, that um, Clinton stuff on the six phases of leadership development, I don't know if you've ever read it. The first phase is called Sovereign Foundations. And the thing is this, I don't know if God makes us do stuff or puts us in positions, but he allows different things to happen, definitely. But we, we do make decisions, and our decisions have consequences. So we have to take ownership of that, right? But I do know that he wastes nothing. And that the thing is that he can redeem what was lost and what was dirty, what was broken, and he can redeem it and utilize it in a way that brings him glory. He can do that. So one thing I know is, you know, I'd lived that life. I made decisions to live that life. I wasn't forced into it. No one stuck needles in me. No one put a gun in me hand. No one done that stuff. I did that stuff. Whatever the circumstances, whatever the reasons, the, the, the onus was on me. But when Jesus saved me and redeemed me, he redeemed that as well. And he took it and he, he, you know, he, he, he's used it for his honor and his glory. I've led thousands of people to the Lord by his grace. You know what I mean? And it's been an amazing thing to see people come because of a testimony. Because, you know, I mean, I'm friends with Nicky Cruz. You know, I've done crusades for him across the world. And uh, he was a gang leader. You know what I mean? He gets up and preaches. And I'll be honest with you, I can't understand half of what he says. It's like he talks, you know, in broken Spanish and all that. Even now, I'm like, you're 80 odd years old, man. Nicky, you could have learned English by now, brother. What's the matter with you? You know what I mean? Um, and then he'll make an altar call and thousands of people come running up crying, broken and giving their lives to Jesus. But there's an anointing and there's an anointing and God uses stuff and he uses all of our backgrounds. It doesn't matter where we're from, right? He will use our background to reach someone. If you allow him, your testimony is important. Look at a woman at, at the well in Samaria, right? Come and meet a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Later on, they said, at first, they said, we came to him because of your testimony. But then we heard him for ourselves, and now we know that this is the Messiah. So a testimony brought loads of people to Jesus, and then Jesus saved them. So whatever your story is, whether you were you know, a gambler, my mate, was, uh, he told me, he was, he was addicted to sucking alien balloons for 30 years. Like 30 years? I said, why didn't you stop earlier? He said, no one took my cries for help seriously. Help! <laughs> that was a slow burner in summer, yeah? You're like, help! Help, I need your help! <laughs> but, um, 
whatever your story is, let God redeem it and use it. Because someone out there needs to hear it. Are you with me? And that might be just the thing. You lost your job, you had depression, you broke down, you, you, know, you lost your relationship, something happened, you gambled, you, you drank, you did this, you did that, da, 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 whatever. But then Jesus, but then God, but God, but God, but God. And now, and they're, 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 they're going, what? If you did that with him, maybe he can do it with me. Maybe I need to meet this Messiah. And then Jesus does what Jesus does. Amazing. Maybe you can just stay here because we would love to pray for him, wouldn't we? Anybody been blessed this day, this, today? I know I have. Fabulous. And uh, I know you said you'd already received much, but I think you might need to receive a bit more yet. So maybe we can just stand and put our hands towards him and just... Uh, just pray your own prayers towards him. I, I, I don't have to pray, but I felt like we should pray, maybe all together, and just speak good things, favour, blessing, prosperity, wisdom, peace, grace, mercy, kindness, goodness, love, depth. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for the depths that you've taken, Paul. The depths in you, the depths of your love, the depths of your grace, the depths of your wisdom. And we thank you that we've received from those depths, Lord. We want to thank you for the healing of his wounds, Father, that he operates out of an overflow of his heart, Father, and for all you've done in him. All those holes and wounds, Lord, that you've healed in him, Father, that allow him to operate out of an overflow. And we pray, for, first of all, that of all he's given out, that you would fill him up, Jesus. That he would go out of here, not exhausted and wiped out and drained, but full of you in the name of Jesus. That you would fill him up to overflowing again, Father, in Jesus' name. And Father, we ask as well that you would take him to new depths, Father. That you would deepen his love for you. Deepen his capacity, Father. You'd expand the ball, as it were. That he might be a much deeper, wider, fuller container of you, in Jesus' name. We thank you for the depths of love in his heart, Father. And we pray, Lord, you'd fill him up more and more and more. That he might be overwhelmed, Lord. We speak an overwhelming sense of your love over him, Father. Firstly for himself, for those around him, and that it might flow out, Father. I pray, Lord, he'd find himself in his times with you, Lord, that he'd just be overwhelmed with your love, broken by your love, Father. That he'd know it to whole new depths and realms and places. And that as you fill him more and more and enlarge the container that you've got for him, Lord, that you might flow out of him even greater rivers of life than we have received today, Father. We speak blessing and good things and every favour and prosperity upon him and all that he touches in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.